I'm Mark Herzl from American Honda Motor Company, and it's my privilege as the first vice president and the chair of the programs committee of your Foreign Trade Association to introduce you to today's webinar. Uh, today um, and, and in the future, we're going to have uh, some exciting events. Uh, we've got Heather Littman giving a webinar on regulations on the legal importation of gray market goods on March 5th. Um, we're also working to have a webinar with Ted Prince reviewing the state of intermodal infrastructure uh, sometime in the second week of March and uh, working with the Digital uh, Container Shipping Association and um, IOTA.org, which is a digital ledger platform uh, who will be presenting on emerging technologies and trade automation. Um, FTA Director Michael Roll is also working on a webinar for CBP enforcement tools and uh, today we just heard uh, that uh, FDA has committed uh, for another event in March. So lots of exciting things coming up. If you find these topics of interest and you haven't already become a member of the Foreign Trade Association, uh, right now we have special 50% off uh, membership rates um, for certain situations. A uh, corporation uh, regularly 600 is now 300 and one person 300 is now 150. There's some qualifications on that and to how long you've been a member, but certainly encourage you to, to take a look at that and encourage you to, to join. Um, we're gonna ask that you again, keep your, um, your cameras off and listen only mode. If you do have a question for the speakers today, we ask that you type it into the chat box um, or save it for the end of the presentation when we're gonna unmute and let people um, answer the Q&A. So today's presentation is sponsored by Roanoke Trade. For all your trade and transportation insurance needs, see Roanoke. Uh, today's webinar will feature a past president and a current member of the Board of Directors of the Foreign Trade Association. Uh, Keith Sanchez is a licensed insurance broker and one of the founding partners of Avalon Risk Management. He currently oversees Avalon's Western uh, division offices, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle. With 10 offices nationwide, Avalon has uh, positioned itself as a premier provider of innovative insurance and surety solutions and products for the international trade and transportation community. Keith has spent the last 36 years in financial industry, um, services industry, excuse me, with 28 years uh, specifically catering to international trade and transportation community. Keith is the past president of the Foreign Trade Association, a past president of the Harbor Transportation Club, and currently serves on the District Export Council of Southern California and on the International Seafarer Center for the Port of LA Long Beach. He's an active member in many other regional and local and national trade organizations. He's a past instructor at the uh, GLS program offered at Cal State Long Beach and holds a BA in accounting and finance from Westminster College. Patrice Lafayette is also a licensed insurance broker in several states and recently promoted to be vice president for sales uh, for the Western Division of Roanoke Trade, who is also the sponsor for today's event. With over 15 years of insurance and international trade experience, she is well, she's a well-respected advisor on risk management of insurance and bonds for the international trade community. She frequently delivers various workshops for clients as well as local and national transportation association meetings. A graduate of Cal State University Northridge where she earned a Bachelor of Science in Finance, Patrice serves on the executive committee for the board of directors of the Foreign Trade Association and is also an active participant in a number of California trade associations. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Patrice. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Keith and I are just going to go over some different things with cargo insurance. Uh, we're going to go over some sort of claim scenarios and pictures that hopefully might scare you or that you might have seen in the media recently or over the years. Give you some ideas of what a cargo insurance policy does, as well as uh, different things that carriers limit their liability. And we're talking about international and also domestic. It's a lot to go over, so we're gonna try to make it as quick as possible um, and hopefully keep it simple for you. Um, this is sort of just a, a surface topic because the insurance policy can certainly be delved into further, but hopefully we can get you some uh, basic information. 
So the topics today that we're going to cover, and we're just going to kind of go back and forth in, in talking, is uh, different inherent risks that happen, why cargo insurance matters, the carrier's limits of liability. We're going to touch on general average, uh, domestic transportation exposures, the basics of cargo insurance, force majeure and cargo insurance implication, and then give you some best practices. So these are just some pictures of inherent risks of nature or what cargo insurance policies love to call acts of God. Um, you know, there's hurricanes like Hurricane Harvey and Maria, uh, various earthquakes in Mexico, Taiwan, Japan, Indonesia. Um, there's flooding uh, from, you know, the Louisiana flooding or the monsoons in Bangladesh, uh, lots of different tsunamis. This one is actually in New Zealand of when an earthquake actually happened after that. There's typhoons, um, landslides, and then there's sort of, you know, man-made risks of wildfires, whether it's here in California or Tennessee. Um, there was the Beirut port explosion. There's been others beyond that and also uh, there's been bankruptcies of, of, of vessel carriers. On top of those types of things that can happen to your cargo, whether it's storms and things like that, there's also theft. And theft is something that is more common in the domestic world. If you can see that 80% of, of the thefts that occurred in 2019 were by truck. We don't have the 2020 numbers right now. Uh, it's still kind of trickling in. Some of that's due to the, the possibly the pandemic and people working at home and you know maybe just uh, sort of the delay in reporting their thefts. But either way, we, we just don't have the full numbers yet. But this is pretty much generally how it always is year after year. Um, the other thing to note here is the top commodities that are stolen. It's usually food and beverage, which also includes pharmaceuticals and electronics. Part of that is they're smaller, easier to sort of sell on the black market, uh, but this is pretty common, like I said, year after year. So we're going to go now into sort of, and Keith will go further into, into the domestic thefts and, and give you some more details on that. So, but we're going to go into now why cargo insurance matters. So why insure your cargo? Well, not just because of the rigors of shipping that we went over, but you know, with the loss, damage, and theft, there's also general average claims. Um, I know many of you probably know about the one APIS vessel that's currently uh, being looked at and evaluated. It's not fully done, but it's something that will will turn into that. Um, and that's a, that's some, usually happens anywhere from nine to twenty times a year. So we're going to go a little bit over that. Um, also, again, with cargo theft. There's uh, estimated about 10 to $20 billion of cargo theft that's stolen annually. Um, and then we're gonna go into a little bit also of carriers uh, liability and when they only pay claims when they're liable. So not necessarily when you know something happens to your cargo, you have to actually prove that they're liable for that. And we're gonna go into detail a little bit about that. And then also trucking and warehousing. So many people say this, the carrier, they will cover their loss, your loss, won't they? So there is, you know, a lot of people wonder why they're not responsible for the shipment. Really, the carriers are in the business of just moving your cargo from point A to point B, and they have limited responsibility for that. Why is that? Well, they typically limit their liability on the bill of lading. Uh, when you don't have insurance and you are forced to try to recover, the burden really becomes on the shipper or the cargo owner to prove that the carrier was actually at fault. When you have insurance, the burden becomes on the insurance company to find that. And so it's a complete turnaround for who is actually responsible. There are a lot of different um, exclusions that carriers are liable for depending on the mode of transportation. There are a lot of difference why they aren't responsible, but to understand that you also have to prove where they are responsible because that is the most important. So like you know, we were talking about earlier, sort of acts of God and heavy weather, that's not the carrier's responsibility. That was out of their control. So carriers have various monetary amounts that they're responsible for. You can kind of think of cargo as liability in two sections. One section says, here are the things we can be responsible for, and the other of what we aren't responsible for. For instance, acts of God, like weather is out of their control, like I stated. So if you're able to prove 
that they were responsible, the next step is to figure out how much they are responsible for monetarily. So then you look at the different conventions that govern cargo liability. You have COGSA under ocean carriers, Warsaw or Montreal Convention under international air carriers, and then CARMAC on the domestic side. So international air and ocean shipments are pretty cut and dry, but there's a lot of confusion in domestic. Why is that? Because the surface freight forwarder and trucker are subject to the CARMAC amendment. It says you are fully liable for this cargo, however you choose to limit it by a contract, a tariff, or a bill of lading, and can limit it to whatever dollar amount you want. We see a very common amount of 50 cents a pound, but it's not required, it's just common. The other thing on the domestic is you will see the existence of insurance certificates because those things tell someone what type of insurance a trucker might have. So let's say you see a certificate that says they have 250,000 in liability, but that doesn't mean it actually covers the cargo. It's not a governing document. It just says that they have insurance. It also doesn't mean that they have insurance on the date of your claim. It doesn't give your customer insurance or an amount, only the bill of ladings contract or tariff do. Keith will go into this a little bit further in the future of our next slides. There is something that you can do with a carrier since they do limit their liability uh, monetarily. They have to allow a cargo owner to declare a higher value of their shipment. There's a box on the bill of lading that will say declared value and there's a box that sometimes says insurance depending if they, they will sell insurance. So there's a lot of confusion around declared value being insurance. It's not insurance at all. It simply allows the cargo owner to increase the amount they can get to from the carrier, but it doesn't change the carrier's liability. If they aren't responsible for things outside of their control, there is no more responsibility for it under declared value than it was if you had not purchased it. The same exclusions of liability apply that we went over. It only increases the monetary amount of money that, that you as a cargo owner can claim if the carrier can be proven liable. There is a cost to it and it is really expensive. It is typically not any cheaper than insurance. So why use declared value? If your insurance company requires it possibly because it's a higher risk cargo and they don't want to insure it. Uh, another reason might be is that the deductible on the policy is so high you want to make sure there is a claim under the policy that you can also get back your deductible. We see this more under trade show and exhibition customers than in other places. It doesn't give them insurance and it also doesn't require them to declare value up to the limit of the invoice. It's just simply a way to get more money if the carrier is found responsible. So Keith is going to go over some general average information. Thank you, Patrice, um, <clears throat> and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I wish I could see you all, but uh, all I see is Patrice at this point, but uh, in any <laughs> case, uh, listen, um, I'm here to talk about general average. Um, you know, I've spoken a number of times about um, this in particular. It's, um, it's, it's a crazy maritime law that's been around for eons and eons, and the basic concept is that Everybody has an interest in a particular voyage, um, and those that get sac their, their, their containers or, or get some sort of sacrifice from um, the voyage to allow it to continue on, the others that are uh, contributory to the voyage have to make up uh, for that in the contribution based off of their percentage of uh, value on a particular um, vessel. So again, this is only from the ocean side, maritime side. Um, and what happens is basically, as uh, I'll go through, there's a couple of vessels that we've had um, as of late. Um, and uh, the captain kind of pulls into port when he finally gets there, if he actually gets there. And again, the, the voyage has to be saved in order for a uh, general average to be declared. But the captain declares a general average um, and uh, all the, uh, the cargo is, um, is seized at this point. So if you haven't looked at the back of a bill of lading lately, uh, it's in small print and there's, uh, there's a whole clause in there regarding general average, but it happens quite a bit. Patrice. <clears throat> so these are just uh, a couple of the um, <clears throat> general averages that we've had in the past. Um, you know, these are caused by um, some major fires you know, whether it happens from the uh, the vessel catching on fire because of the engine itself, 
um, the engine can't get out um, and it needs to be towed, or um, what we've been seeing a lot of, of is um, this uh, declaration of uh, cargo and it's dangerous goods. People are trying to um, you know, scam um, getting uh, some of these uh, cargoes into the United States, misdeclaring it as something else. And then all of a sudden we've got an explosion uh, in a particular container that spreads to, to other containers. Um, and obviously there's, um, there's a need to put the fire out and save the voyage. And there's a lot of expenses that are incurred. So go ahead, Patrice. Here's a couple of pictures, uh, the Antian Express, um, you got the Vancouver, the APL, and the Kobe. And I just kind of put these up and you might have seen some of, the, some of you might have seen these before. But um, again, um, you can see there's 220 containers uh, on the Antian. Um, and actually, um, there, there was actually some more at the end of the day that, that became a total loss at the end. Uh, 947 on the Vancouver. Uh, the Kobe, I didn't have those numbers on there, but they had quite, quite a few losses uh, in containers as well on that one. So next slide, Patrice. Um, so as I said, how it works, um, all the freight is, uh, is seized. The value is determined. And in the next slide, I, I, I give a, a sample of how you calculate this. And you got to think of it as what's all in the value of, of the voyage in particular. You've got the vessel itself. And then you've got all the containers that are on board and the values inside those containers. So everybody has a percentage of participation in the voyage. And that is, um, and, and based off of what the loss was and how many containers might've had to be jettisoned uh, overboard to get to a particular fire to put it out um, and or some other um, expenses as in uh, if there's a fire on the vessel and uh, the ship is stalled, you need to um, obviously get towed into a port um, to save the voyage. Uh, all those expenses um, get added up, okay? And we figure out what the total expense is, and then we look at the percentage of what a ship owner or cargo owner's value is on the, uh, on the vessel. So next. So here's just the calculations for you. Vessel and freight value, a million. Saved cargo value is a million. So the total value on there is two, 200 million. Um, and uh, the, the cargo that was sacrificed was $40 million. So this represents 20% of the value of the full voyage. So all the co cargo owners who had <clears throat> cargo on that vessel, depending on the value of the cargo that they had, they had to throw in 20% <clears throat> uh, of their cargo value uh, to pay for the other losses uh, that occurred on the vessel. So in this particular case, I just took 100,000 for a shipment at 20%, uh, a shippers whose cargo is still intact on the vessel has to pony up $20,000 uh, in order to get their cargo released. Okay, um, so that that is, if in fact they did not have cargo insurance. The beauty of cargo insurance um, on top of a, a, a number of other things is that it'll respond and throw up uh, the security <clears throat> and a bond, uh, whether it's cash or whatnot, for that $20,000, your cargo can get released and you can move on. Uh, what's the big deal about that? Well, one is, um, Again, on the bottom here, general average claims take years to resolve. You got to figure out, you know, what was the cause, who caused it, um, and then um, negotiate with everybody um, on, um, you know, the actual final uh, general average um, adjustment on it. So, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> for the Antin Express, uh, you know, the poster child here, you can see this was a fire that occurred. Um, many of you might have seen this. I've used these slides in a couple of presentations, but you can understand that um, just the expense of getting these containers off the vessel, it's not like you have a crane and you can put it in the, the little eyes at the end of the containers and then just lift it up and drop it and, and inspect the container. Now, these are all riggings and this takes days and months to do and a lot of sophisticated work to uh, get these um, containers off. Next slide. So there's a big expense that are involved. So the Antian, there's um, there was 420 containers with the total loss. So here, I just want to you know I want to monetize this for you guys. Um, 
So if you don't have insurance and you have a $100,000 uh, container on the Yantine Express, all right, the general average, uh, the calculation is right here. Basically 60%, 60.5% is the cash deposit that is required. If you have cargo insurance, um, the insurance company will put up a bond or cash in order to get your cargo release. If you don't, you're going to have to pony up $60,500 to get your goods released. So that's quite a substantial amount of money. And quite honestly, um, probably will blow your whole profitability on that particular, particular um, shipment there. So next. So some of the other hidden costs, um, you know, uh, with the Antian, they had, uh, I think it was down in Freeport, Bahamas, they had towed it there. No one else wanted them to come into their port. Obviously our ports are congested already. Could you imagine if it came into the, you know, it was on the East Coast, but at the port of LA or Long Beach and how much time and space that would take up. So finding a port is a problem. Unloading is a problem. Sorting is a problem. You know, is your cargo unknown? Obviously, is a problem. You know, if you've got LCL and it's a consolidated shipment, you know, do the other folks in the container have um, cargo insurance to get theirs released? When are you going to be able to get yours released? Um, uh, and then, obviously, loss of profit and loss of opportunity. So, next slide. So that that was on the ocean side. Um, the on the domestic side, as Patrice had mentioned, um, you know. Uh, truck theft is uh, the, the highest percent, I think it was 87%. I think I got a slide on that. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> and uh, obviously, uh, things move domestically uh, in only a, a couple ways once it gets off a vessel or when it's going to uh, the port as well. And um, trucking is obviously a big deal. So with COVID, um, one of the things we were looking at, um, it's, it's kind of the perfect storm right now. Obviously, there's a lot of people that are unemployed, okay? Um, they're hurting right now. Um, some people don't have any money to feed their kids. Um, you know, drastic times turn people into drastic measures. So there is, uh, you know, an uptick of, of crime when people need to get money. And obviously, um, one of the ways of getting um, some cash is uh, theft of cargo. Um, and cargo thefts, again, uh, if, if you do get caught in some uh, areas, you know, you're only going to have a year sentence, maybe two years sentence. So if you get a million dollars of uh, Xboxes and you could sell them on the street for 50 cents on the dollar, you know, that's $500,000. Is it worth spending a year or two years in jail and coming out and having $500,000, you know? The other uh, deal is, uh, you know, they're talking about defunding police. We're already seeing it in LA in some areas. Um, and so that's going to cause, um, you know, some issues with uh, having the, um, the, the, the staff to even chase after these folks. Uh, diversion with protests, uh, we've been seeing some of that as well, not as much, but again, police are focusing on that and not focusing on chasing down uh, criminals stealing, um, you know, cargo as well. The courts are uh, obviously closed and backlogged. So even if you've got caught, you know, you might not go to trial for quite some time. Even if you get convicted, the jails are, are closed and full. So you might not even go to jail. All right. And then the other thing I know in LA here with our um, new uh, district attorney, uh, he's in the process of releasing a lot of uh, our criminals in there. So um, in any case, uh, you know, there, there's a perfect storm out there for um, people to start chasing after cargo. Uh, let's see, hold on. I see that there's a question here. Does the party who also lost their goods in a general average also have to contribute? No, um, they, they do not because their cargo is uh, actually lost. So, okay. Um, so uh, back to domestic uh, transport. Um, Again, this is the same slide. I uh, just want to reiterate uh, what Patrice had, uh, had mentioned. Uh, you know, domestically, it's, you know, it's a 10 to $20 billion dollar <clears throat> um, industry and 87% is from trucking. The other big thing is 80% is, uh, uh, is, is collusion where the driver's in on it or the warehouse guy's in on it. And the reason why I mentioned that, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later in, in some of the coverages you need to be aware of. 
Um, Patrice mentioned they limit to liability. So, uh, you know, CARMAC governs um, interstate commerce, you know, when you cross the state line, it stipulates that the trucker is, um, is liable for the full, full value of the cargo. However, there's a caveat to that um, in regards to the coverages that might, they might have secured for, um, for their companies and their, and, their, and their carriers as well. So, um, the next slide. Uh, these are the limits of liabilities. I always tell people to print this sucker and put it up on their um, their cube or their office if you're having conversations with your customers. Um, and then I'm, uh, you know, uh, in regards to ocean, the top uh, and error, the top uh, three are uh, will respond to that. But on the bottom, domestic air, warehouse, local carriers. Um, you know, in in, in Patrice's slide, usually it's uh, the standard is fifty cents a pound or fifty dollars a shipment. So, you know you have to prove that they're negligent in order for them to even pay, period. Uh, so that in itself could be difficult, uh, especially with acts of God and that sort of thing. And then Carmack is for interstate and it's full value. But uh, one of the things that, uh, next slide, is, is that you need to think about, and a lot of people don't, and that's why I'm kind of bringing this up, is that there's many insurance policies out there. There's a lot of trucking companies out there you know, are they insured um, appropriately? Uh, trucking companies were hurting. Of course, there's a, a lack of capacity now, but uh, originally um, they were hurting for money um, as well as a number of other people. You know, are they paying for their coverages, um, have their policy lapse? Uh, the other thing is when, even if they do have insurance, you know, depending on the situation, you know, what are the terms of condition of their motor truck cargo coverage? Next slide. You know, um, are there things that you need to even think about? And there are, of course. That's why I'm talking about it. So, uh, for truck exposures, um, again, Carmack governs. There's a thing called a release value doctrine that basically states that if you're going to limit your liability in any way, you have to give the shipper an opportunity to declare value to you. So, that's Patrice has mentioned declared value. Again, it's different than all risk insurance. You have to prove that they're negligent, but then you can increase the limit of liability. A lot of carriers might domestically um, limit their liability to 50 cents a pound, whether it's LTL carrier or an FTL carrier. So you need to make sure that the, the, the carrier that you're using, uh, you know, what their limits of liabilities are, okay, uh, in the motor truck cargo policy. So some of the issues within the policies, and I'll quickly go through here, there's exclusions that people don't even know about. Uh, obviously, the top part, if they don't pay their premium, you have a certificate of insurance. Um, you, as Patrice said, you're not sure whether they've got insurance in place or not. So all these things you have to think about. Um, commodities, there's exclusions. You know, some policies don't cover reefer, uh, refrigerated shipments. Um, you know, on the policy of motor truck, the vehicle has to be scheduled in order for the insurance to even come into play. You know, dishonest acts of a carrier. I mentioned about 80% of the crime is done by, uh, uh, you know, the driver or, or the um, in-house personnel. So uh, this exclusion says basically they will not pay any claims if it is an employee within the organization that stole the cargo. So right there, their insurance, the trucker's insurance won't respond. Radius, if you go outside of 500 miles, unattended vehicles, you know, the driver goes to his house. We've got a lot of that. Um, it will not respond to those things. Sublimits on cargoes um, and theft for higher um, uh, or theft on commodities for like, um, you know, Xboxes with um, higher deductibles as well. You know, some policies only have 100,000 in limit. You know, if you're shipping 500,000 or million dollar loads in a tr with a trucker, you need to check and see what their limits are. Obviously, you get the certificate of insurance, but all these other things, uh, are in the background that you might not know about. Some policies also say, you know, if uh, if you stop, they need to be the truck or tractor or the container needs to be in a, uh, a designated terminal that needs to be, you know, uh, listed on the policy and or in a gated yard. And then obviously there's an acts of God, which they're not responsible for at all. So, so uh, on the trucking side, now, if you don't hire uh, the direct trucker, the next slide, You've got these things called property brokers, which have uh, have, have grown um, tremendously over the years. And these guys have insurance as well. And I'm not sure if you're all familiar or what their exposures are and what their policies say. 
but um, they have they have uh, uh, combined transit liability policies um, that cover for the cargo. They have a vicarious exposure. Obviously, um, you know they're not moving the freight, um, but um, they, they they do have uh, an exposure to you guys as shippers as well. The exposure um, again to you is if they haven't paid the premium, you can't. Uh, their insurance companies won't respond. You've got some of the same commodities. There's a following form versus non-following form that basically says, um, you know, we are we will only insure up to whatever the underlying carrier will insure. So whatever exclusions the trucker has that they hire, um, um, they they basically um, you know inherit as well. So you got dishonest acts as well. There's dishonest acts of a third party. Sometimes if uh, someone steals the uh, the identity of a trucker. And it gets picked up. There's no coverage there. Um, you know, there's there's um, clauses and policies that says you have to vet the carrier. You know, if the broker didn't do that, there might not be coverage. You know, we have capacity issues um, where you guys as shippers might not have a trucker, and now you're you're going to Keith's Trucking, and you know who knows what Keith's doing, right? Managing his uh, safety uh, policy with his truckers, um, and you can get theft there or you know the brakes are bad and and the and the and the tractor catches on fire and some of those other things again you've got some limits and then you've got some policy limits um and then you've got co-brokering co exposures where some property brokers policies do not allow for brokering so the, the property broker hires a trucker who hires a trucker who hires another trucker and it's, it's four down the line and you don't even know who's got your cargo so anyway um those are some clauses inside policies that you probably don't know about and, and it's really hard for you to know about all these things. Go ahead, next slide. So again, just about the, the, uh, bringing all those things out just so that um, you understand the reason of why, why you need to buy cargo insurance. And I'm gonna turn it over to per, Patrice to uh, go through some of the basics for you guys. I think you're muted. Sorry, yeah, I was, sorry. Um, okay, so we're gonna go over the basics of a cargo policy. Um, it, it's hard to go into too much detail because all cargo policies are definitely not created equal. Um, like your auto insurance or homeowner's insurance, those policies are standard and the coverages are standard. But with cargo policies, they're not entirely standard. You can add things, you can delete things by endorsement, by clauses. Um, you really have to read what things are showing in a cargo policy, whether it's your own or whether someone's trying to sell you insurance or tell you that they, that they also have insurance. So you can kind of think as, of a cargo policy sort of as an umbrella sitting over your stuff. It sits over all of your shipments. Um, it sets out the parameters of your coverage specifically, and it gives you special insuring conditions, um, different types of things that that may be excluded. Sometimes it's wear and tear. Sometimes it's you know rusting on an, on some type of equipment. Um, it also gives you your limits, which are really important. Uh, sometimes it's you know your limits are not just per shipment, but also per conveyance. And, and I know we'll talk a little bit that, about that further also, but that's really important, especially if you have more than one shipment on a vessel uh, or in any conveyance for that matter. Um, and it also gives you your deductibles and exclusions. So these are definitely important to, to look at just because if, if you think that you have a certain coverage, but there might be a, a smaller limit for that specific type of cargo, because all different types of cargo also have different limits, especially the ones that are, are, are higher risk. So where does coverage begin and where does it end? Typically, you know, you'll hear door to door coverage or warehouse to warehouse coverage. Um, there is a time element in the warehouse to warehouse clause that's in a typical cargo policy that states that once the cargo is discharged from the arrival conveyance, you have 15 days to get it there if it's in the port city or 30 days if it's outside of the port city of arrival, and that will be included in that coverage. However, there's always exceptions, like I said, and there's different clauses that can be added to your policy that can extend some of these time elements, and Keith will go over that a little bit further uh, later on. 
So there's really two basic types of cargo insurance in your policy. One is called all risk and the other is called free of particular average. When someone doesn't necessarily write out the entire description of all risk and they just put quotations around it, it's really just because it's not actually all risk. It's just all risk of physical loss or damage from an external cause. Something has to happen to the cargo that causes physical loss or damage in order to have coverage. Another way of thinking this is it covers everything except for blank, 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 and the FPA covers everything but blank, 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 or covers nothing but, sorry, uh, nothing but blank, blank, blank. So you're always going to want to ask for the all-risk insurance because it's definitely more comprehensive and there's more coverage to it. But sometimes the underwriters won't give you that broader coverage just simply because it's a higher risk, so you'll have to purchase FPA. This is a long list of what all risk covers. Uh, again, it's everything but. So I'm not gonna go over each one, but I'm just gonna cover a few that are on this list. Um, improper packing isn't covered when it's controlled by the shipper uh, doing the packing. They either packed it themselves or gave instructions for packing and that isn't covered. Uh, if they hired a professional packing company and didn't give instructions, then this can be covered because it wasn't their responsibility. Uh, there's loss of market or delay. Uh, so let's just say you're shipping calendars and they ship in October, but they weren't delivered until February. They arrived in perfect condition, they were not damaged, but because they were delivered in February, you may have lost the ability to sell them. That is a financial loss. It's not a physical loss or damage, so it wouldn't be covered in the all risk. Another one would be rejection. So if a shipment is rejected by a government agency, um, but there still is no physical loss or damage, then it also is not covered. So those are just some exclusions under all risk. There's also war and, and strikes, riots and civil commotions, but I'm gonna go over how you can add that coverage back in. So FPA coverage is nothing is covered except what is listed. So it's, it's less comprehensive, but it's still insurance coverage. Now, war coverage is a separate policy. And, and when war coverage is in effect, it's in effect when it's on the vessel in the water or on an aircraft in the air. Once the vessel reaches port or the aircraft touches ground, there's no coverage. War coverage includes piracy or terrorism. Um, and a war policy can also be canceled or changed in 48 hours. It's different than a regular cargo policy. An insurance company is required to give you 30 days notice to make changes or to cancel. But because of the quick changes in a war or a riot, civil commotion, um, they are allowed to do that within 48 hours. So it's a little bit uh, it, people have to stay on top of it more. The insurance companies tend to do that. Um, Normally, they're updating their systems and, you know, looking at their websites to look at the different when things are actually taking place. And then they'll change, the rates will also change because the rates on the policy will be higher if there is a war going on. So strikes, riots, and civil commotion is a land coverage. It isn't the same as, I mean, it's the same as war coverage, but it isn't war coverage. It's, it's caused by physical loss or damage due to political uprisings, riots, strikes, civil commotions. And then there's piracy. Um, I know that this picture is not your typical, you know, Johnny Depp on Pirates of the Caribbean, but this is truly what pirates look like out there. Um, it is alive and well every day. It is covered under the war policy. Um, so you, they still do have that 48 hours to be able to exclude coverages in areas where piracy might be going on or where a war has broken out. So how to calculate uh, proper insured value. So it's not just your invoice amount and the value. You do want to include freight and other expenses in that and plus 10%. So that's generally how we, you don't have to do that, but that's what we suggest that when you're looking at how to value what you're insuring on your shipments, that that is how you would calculate that. Now, if you underinsure, there is um, coinsurance possibilities um, and there is fraud assumed if there's undervaluation intended. 
Sometimes this happens. Uh, we've seen this more and more lately where someone's trying to avoid customs duties, uh, possibly saving premium, um, you know, even the, the tariffs and the 301 duties. So people tend sometimes might classify something in one way, but it's a different thing in the container. And you might say the value is only 10 cents when it should have been, you know, $10. And there are penalties that apply to your insurance if that happens. Here's an example of a coinsurance calculation. Um, let's just say the value was supposed to be 50,000 and you only insured it for 30,000. So your claim amount becomes 30,000. The amount insured is a percentage of the value that it should have been. So that $30,000 of the actual 50,000 is only 60%. So the insurance company will only pay the 60% of that insured amount that the claim amount is. So that would only be $18,000, where if you had just actually insured for the full value, you would have been able to claim the full value minus your deductible. Okay, Keith is now gonna go over some force majeure and the cargo insurance implications. Thank you, Patrice. Um, so, um, so force majeure, uh, obviously when, when COVID first came out, um, a lot of things started happening, whether it's the ports um, were shutting down, whether warehouses were shutting down, and, um, and a lot of contracts um, were breached or, or, or did not get completed uh, because um, they couldn't, period. Uh, you know, they, you didn't have employees to uh, receive the goods, you didn't have employees to uh, pack the goods, and so um, people were scrambling. And so one of the things, uh, you know, we wanted to just bring up uh, was, again, force majeure um, and some of the things that may, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's uh, the dust is, is either settled or, you know, it's, you know, the, the cloud has moved, but um, who knows whether the new variants might cause some other uh, places to uh, shut down. But in any, any case, the force majeure is, is basically an event or an effect that can be neither anticipated nor controlled. It's something that came out of nowhere that um, you could not perform um, your duties within a particular contract because things um, that are out of your control cause you not to be able to perform. And so if you look at a bunch of contracts uh, out there, and again, if you look at the back of that, that bill of lading of yours, um, there's a uh, little small print and there's a, uh, a section in there that talks about force majeure. And what that uh, basically is, is it's a clause that uh, anybody within a contract can um, cite and not have to um, actually do what you've paid them to do. So, um, so why are we talking about this? Next slide. <clears throat> You know, so, so there's a lot of things that happen um, when people don't do, uh, don't have to do the things that they do. Um, you know, I mean, we're still having blank sailings uh, right now. Uh, we got port closures, you know, some plants are, uh, have been closed, warehouses have been closed, and constant needs have been obviously shut down. So, um, you know, what's, what's again, I, I guess, what's the big deal and why am I talking about it? Well, even if you do have cargo insurance, there's some clauses within the policies that I want to bring to your attention um, that you need to think about and be aware of uh, because they might affect whether, even if you bought the cargo insurance, whether you've got coverage or not. So um, I'm not sure if any of you have experienced, well, we've all experienced, um, you know, obviously these um, closures and whatnot, but uh, in regards to someone invoking force majeure, and next thing you know, all your containers are sitting there not moving. You know, things, certain things start to happen that I want you to think about. So next slide. <clears throat> you know, with, the, with these, you know, uh, unique exposures, um, um, you know, again, that you have situations where um, you've got a gathering of, uh, or an accumulation of cargo and people don't necessarily think about it. It's just like, okay, it's sitting there, it's still insured, I should be good. I'm not sure when it's gonna move, but that's not necessarily um, the case. I mean, a lot of cargo owners, you know, assume that all the damages um, and costs will be covered by cargo insurance, and, and that isn't the case. 
Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, you get some questions. What if the port closure, closure causes delay or you incur detention or demerge charges? You know, we'll answer those. Um, what if the carrier redirects the vessel to another destination? What if my cargo rolls on a blank sailing is on the next sailing? What if my shipment arrives in the U.S. and cannot be delivered to the consignee because they're shut down by the state or whatever? What if the shipment uh, above is, is not is above not insured and the shipment is on your bill of lading? You know, again, I, the the audience we might we might have some NVOs in here as well as shippers. You know, what is my liability there? Uh, what if all my shipments? are all insured, um, cargo insurance, uh, I'm covered, right. So the misconception is, is that cargo insurance, you know, covers everything, but there are clauses that you need to be aware of. Next slide. Um, as Patrice had mentioned, uh, cargo insurance covers the, you know, the physical, direct physical loss or damage to goods while they're in tra transit, okay? So I want you to let you know uh, goods that are in transit. Um, you know, uh, as, as you can see with ports closing and blank sailings, your goods start to sit there and they start to accumulate. So you need to think about the, the, uh, the amount of, uh, values that are sitting in one particular, uh, area or uh, warehouse or yard or port. So the other thing is the extra costs that you might incur because it is sitting there, whether it's detention to merge. Um, or even the cost of getting it back uh, to the original um, destination because it's stuck in a at a particular plus, uh, port. Those those charges are not included in your insurance. Um, refrigerated cargo again, if it's delayed, you know the big thing delay in a cargo policy is not insured. So if the cargo in a reefer container is 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 um, you know if, if there's a claim. And it's not because of the breakdown of the equipment, but it's because of the delay, it's not always covered. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of claims um, that might not be covered for non-perishables as well. Um, next slide. So the delay clause, warranted free of, of claim from loss of market or for loss damage or deterioration arising from delay, whether caused by apparel is insured against or otherwise, unless expressly assumed in writing herein. So again, your cargo policies don't cover delay. You're gonna get a lot of delays when a force majeure is declared. And the problem is, is that a lot of times your cargo insurance will not necessarily cover that, okay? And again, as I mentioned, the extra expenses, demerge and detention, those are not going to be covered. Um, obviously FMC is working on um, you know, fair practices and reasonable guidelines for detention and demerge. So that remains to be seen if we're gonna get some help from, from the FMC there. Uh, next slide. The accumulation clause, and this is probably one of the bigger ones and it just kinda, I, I, I mean, I have the clause itself in here. I'll just read uh, it briefly. Should there be an accumulation of shipments in respect of which the insured value exceeds the limit expressed in the policy by reason of interruption of transit and or other occurrences beyond the control of the insured um, or uh, by reason of any casualty and or at transshipment points in our connecting steamer vessel, but the assured shall hold covered such excess amounts and shall be liable for the full amount at risk provided written notice is given to the insured. Okay, so if uh, this is what I'm talking to you about, uh, and this is a thing you really need to know, if you're starting to get an accumulation of containers whether it's at a, whether it's at a yard, um, whether it's at the port, um, even you know, for that matter, uh, again with the mega ships, and you've got uh, you know a higher uh, amount of values because you've uh, been bounced off a vessel, and now all your containers are going on the next ship, you've got uh, an increased limit there, and so the big deal on this clause is, you know, you have to tell the insurance company that you've got a higher limit in one particular area or on one particular um, conveyance. Uh, and if you don't, they will only be liable for twice the amount of your limit. So again, why is this important? You know, most of your policies are 100 or, uh, to 200, um, I'm sorry, a million to $2 million limits on air and ocean. 
Um, and if you get a consolidation or accumulation of containers in, in, in a particular area, what happens if you have $10 million um, worth of value in that particular um, you know, yard or port? You need to tell your insurance company because the most they will pay out is double the amount of what's on your uh, limit. So while, while I'm talking about this, one of the things, I guess in the best part, you actually want to you know, talk to your broker and check and see what your limits are at any location or any conveyance. Next slide. Um, another uh, clause that's in your cargo insurance policy that you need to be aware of is uh, change in destination clause. I'll just read it again. In the case of voluntary change of destination or deviation or delay within the insured's control, the assured's control, the shipper's control, the insured goods are held covered for an additional premium. If any, at rates to be agreed, the insurer agrees to report as soon as possible all events to these uh, to the insured. So again, you need to tell your insurance company that um, if there's any kind of um, deviation um, or change in destination, uh, you need to share that with them in order for them to um, hold the cargo coverage. I don't think a lot of people actually understand that um, and no one necessarily really sits down and reads their cargo policies, but that's something you need to be aware of as well. Um, and again, we're only co covering for physical loss or da damage. Um, and there's, again, no expenses for demerge or getting the cargo back to the original destination. So um, next. So this clause is consolidation, deep consolidation clause. It's in the cargo policy as well. Um, this you need to pay attention to as well, notwithstanding anything contained here and to the contrary. Um, this insurance uh, is extended to cover the property hereby where uh, wherever same has stopped in transit anywhere in the world short of final destination, whether prior to loading or after discharge over, over ocean sea vessel or any transshipment point for the purpose of consolidation, deconsolidation, packing, repacking, contain, containerization, decontainerization, uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, for the period, and this is the kicker, not to exceed 60 days after the receipt of the merchandise at such premise. So as Patrice has mentioned, um, there's time elements involved in your cargo policy. So you need to pay attention to where your cargo is, how long it's been there, and you need to contact your insurance company to see if there's any issues with it, if it's gonna turn into a 90-day uh, time frame for sitting in one particular um, uh, location. So again, for additional premium, the insurance company will uh, cover your cargo, but you need to tell them. And if you don't tell them, uh, you might, might not be covered. So the next, so deviation, again, the insurance shall not be vitiated by any unintentional error of description of vessel voyage or by deviation change of voyage beyond the control of the insured. Again, you could hold this coverage if there's any change in the, the, uh, the, the voyage because of a, again, a, a force majeure. And that's why I'm, I'm going through these clauses in this particular uh, area uh, because it's happening. You need to contact your insurance company and tell them what the situation is, assess the situation, and then get, um, you know, ask them what the additional premium is, and then of course pay it, okay? Um, next slide. So um, coming to the tail end here, so a couple of best practices for you. Um, so if I haven't said it, uh, I'll say it again. <laughs> contact your insurance broker. Now's the time to review all your insurance uh, insurance policies that are in place right now. And one of the, the, the other bigger things is, you know, the limits on your policies. You know, if you're a shipper and it's your policy, or if you're a freight forwarder and it's your policy and you're insuring a shipper, um, you gotta, you gotta understand like how many shipments or how many containers are on, you know, some of these mega ships, um, you know, before you might have, you know, a million dollars of value. And now with some of these mega ships, um, you know, whether you're the shipper or the, um, you know, the NVO or the forwarder, you might have two to five million dollars of uh, value on a particular, um, you know, conveyance or location. You need to check, uh, you need to analyze that and you need to check with your broker to see whether your limits are high enough, okay? You need to know what's covered and what's not covered. I mean, again, there's a bunch of clauses in there. I only picked a few. Um, so you need to understand some of your responsibilities to the insurance company 
um, when uh, cargo is diverted or delayed as well. Uh, discuss, discuss what coverages might be needed to continue. The insurance and confirmed coverages that are in place. Uh, make sure your employees. So the other big thing is obviously, you know, we talked to the maybe the CFO or or um, some of the, the managers that are um, that might handle the cargo insurance renewal or whatever. Um, you know, your employees and your clients need to know this stuff. So you need to share this with your uh, employees and clients so they can share that uh, with other people as well. Next slide. Um, you know, in regards to force majeure, um, you know, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I will, I play one on TV. But I will tell you that, um, you know, if, if it is invoked, one of the things you need to do, and quite honestly, you should be doing this anyway, is to review all your contracts for any uh, force majeure clauses. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're in a lot of uh, contracts that you're signing. And I can personally tell you, I find a lot of people do not look at their contracts. They do not get an attorney to look at their contracts, um, whether it's even just a, a, a lease where they're moving into it's something new or, um, you know, a new contract with, um, you know, a new client and stuff. So again, you gotta, if, if it is invoked um, and you've got a situation at a port or a warehouse or, or a terminal or whatever, you have to assess the situation, like I said, Got to figure out what the, the, the limits are, uh, what type of cargo is there, you know, the values as well. Um, and then you got to figure out, I think the big thing is, you know, is the cargo in due course of transit? Because there are time elements like, you know, Patrice had mentioned. Um, and if it, if it gets out of transit, your cargo insurance may not respond. Next. <clears throat> so, um, you know, just some basic stuff. Keep in mind, uh, insured cargo while it's moving is good. Insured cargo when it stops and is not in transit is not always good. So again, you need to uh, look at those situations. And next, and that's uh, that's that's it for us. Um, I saw. I guess I don't know, Patricia. You see it? There's. I, I see. There's. Um, Another yeah, question. So, some, some people were asking if yeah. uh, a copy of the presentation would be provided and uh, and uh, Patrice and Keith have generously offered to make that available. So we'll we'll do that and we'll also be presenting, uh, putting a copy of recording of this event on the uh, FTA YouTube uh, channel. So you can go back and, and look at it, you know, have some popcorn, glass of wine, yeah. you know, enjoy. So. <laughs> Um, are, are there any other uh, questions that uh, people have? Uh, by all means, uh, let me know. I guess one question I want to ask is, with the uh, influx of, of these larger vessels, are you seeing um, bigger and sort of more severe claims um, as uh, with, with the, like the ONE uh, APIS? I mean, that, that was huge. How many, how many containers washed overboard? Yeah, they're, they're talking about 1,800, I think it was, uh, was kind of the number. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the exposure is, uh, is um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten a lot larger. Obviously, if a fire catches on a ship and you got more containers, you're going to have more, more losses on there. And I can tell you that um, in the cargo insurance world, um, at least with the insurance companies that are in it, uh, we've been seeing some carriers actually um, leave that particular area because, um, you know, because of the pricing of cargo insurance is actually kind of fairly low for what the actual exposure is. And now that you've got higher aggregations on these um, vessels with more containers for more values, the, uh, the losses are going to be substantially larger when they do occur. And that's a fear factor for, for insurance companies. So, um, yeah, it is a, uh, it's a big deal. I mean, it's great that there's economies of scale in regards to maybe freight costs and savings to the, the vessel owners. Um, but for the cargo insurers, uh, there is a, a, a much larger exposure for them um, in many different ways. And then uh, the mis um, uh, declaration um, of um, different cargos, we're seeing a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of fires and explosions. So yes, <clears throat> the answer is yes. It is a bigger problem for us. It's getting worse. Yeah. Any uh, any other questions uh, that we have out there from any of the other uh, people in the audience? 
I'm not seeing any at this point um, uh, in the chat box, but uh, it's been really helpful to uh, have you uh, two experts with us today. Um, thank you again. Uh, we will take, uh, um, okay, we have, let's see, what's this question here? Um, so uh, we are an NVOCC that focuses on the automotive industry. We are seeing more of our customers wanting to hold the NVOCC liable for the extreme delays that are happening. Any advice to protect ourselves other than uh, claiming uh, force majeure? Is there any coverage for, for delays? Any way you can protect yourself? You, you know, you can, um, <clears throat> I can, I, <clears throat> actually put it in one of my slides. Um, you, can, you can actually try to, to negotiate <clears throat> delay with a, a carrier. Um, and uh, we've, we've done it in the past. Uh, however, I can tell you, it's really hard to do. You need very, um, you have to have very um, strict procedures involved and uh, a lot of detail in order for um, the, uh, the underwriters to, to agree to adding delay as a coverage. For, but for the most part, whether it's your exposure to a, a cargo liability or an e &O claim. Unless you have caused the delay, it wouldn't be covered uh, under your um, your liability policy for an NVO. So all the ships sitting out in the harbor, there would be no way to insure against uh, what's backing up in the San Pedro Bay out there right now. Yeah, at this point, I, you know, I mean, pretty, pretty, <laughs> good luck. You can uh, chime in here, but. Uh, it's it's a it's a hard nut to crack anyway to get delayed coverage, um, and right now, uh, yeah, it's 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 it's, probably, it's a no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just it's not, it's not especially on the cargo side because it's the physical loss or damage. So there's no if there's no physical loss or damage and it's just delayed, it, it doesn't cover. And and again, yeah. also as a carrier, they have to prove that you caused that to happen you know i mean if you actually caused it then you know your you know like he said would 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 put, come in but if you didn't cause anything unfortunately there's not much you can do i mean the other thing is is just making sure that your terms and conditions and you know your agreements with your customers are right and consulting a transportation attorney just making sure that you're having people sign those types of documents as well or having them on your website well, uh, it's been really helpful. Again, if there's uh, other additional questions, certainly ask you to, to email to us and we'll be more than happy to take care of those. Again, thank you, Patrice. Thank you, Keith. Um, and thank you to Roanoke Trade for sponsoring. And remember that all some, although some conditions do apply, if you don't yet hold membership in the FTA, we do have a, a special um, uh, a special uh, membership rate going on through now through the end of February. Um, we have, again, Heather Lippman is going to talk about gray market goods and March 5th, Ted Prince uh, coming up in the second week of March, uh, the Digital Shipping Container Association and IOTA um, probably in April, and Michael Roll on uh, CBP enforcement tools. So again, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we wish you a very uh, safe and uh, happy day. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.